victims of narcissistic abuse experience complex trauma, CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Any clinician would tell you that it is very difficult to distinguish complex trauma from borderline personality disorder. Moreover, many of the victims develop narcissistic traits and behaviors and even, to some extent, psychopathic traits such as defiance or recklessness or contumaciousness, hatred of authority, aggression, externalized aggression, and so on. So what has happened to the victims? What has happened is what I call narcissistic contagion. Narcissism is infectious. Today, I want to come at this topic from another angle, to tackle it with tools from philosophy of all <laughs> disciplines. <laughs> and I'm asking the question, are narcissists the real life zombies? And do they render their victims zombies as well? Or maybe both of these classes of people are actually zimbos. Yeah, there is such a thing as zimbo. And I'm gonna tell you what it is later on. So stay tuned. <clears throat> My name is Sam Vaknin. I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm a former visiting professor of psychology and I'm on the faculty of CIAPS, Center for a Commonwealth for International Advanced Professional Studies, Toronto, Canada, Cambridge, United Kingdom, and an outreach program in Lagos, Nigeria. And apropos Lagos, Nigeria, Let's proceed to the topic of zombie. What is a zombie? In West African, Haitian and other folk beliefs, a zombie is a corpse, a corpse reanimated by witchcraft and used as a slave. <laughs> and that's a great description of the narcissist's typical intimate partner. <laughs> zombie legends in Haitian voodoo um, were based on a real practice, actually. Um, Haitians, not all Haitians, of course, but evil Haitians, kept people alive, living, kept living people in a trance-like state by administering to them specially concocted, powerful herbal drugs. So, in Haiti, at least well into the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, there were real zombies, people in trance-like drug-induced state. Um, at least this is what missionaries have told us. Now today we are a little more skeptical about this story, but missionaries insisted that it, it is true. Zombies are everywhere. You can see them in Hollywood, uh, in movies usually. <laughs> you can see them in works of fiction, in literature, they are menacing, they are ominous, they are robotic, they are living dead stalkers, they are in horror movies and other pop culture genres. Zombies are everywhere and they are proliferating, they have proliferated in the 20th and 21st centuries. I think the rising awareness of narcissism and psychopathy went hand in hand with the zombie phenomenon in popular culture, because zombies capture well the internal world of the narcissist. And to explain what I've just said, we need to revert or to resort to a branch of philosophy known as philosophy of mind. In philosophy of mind, we use zombie arguments. They're also known as P-zombie arguments, philosophical zombie arguments, and I'm going to discuss these arguments a bit later on. But we use zombies in philosophy of mind to demonstrate our inability to separate real people from simulated people, or real intelligence and sentience from simulated artificial intelligence and sentience. So, in a way, the zombie 
argument is at the heart of modern technology and especially emerging artificial intelligence, generative and otherwise. But put that aside and let's go back um, to our main uh, topic, which is narcissism. And before I proceed, I, you need to get a, I need to acquaint you with a word, qualia. Qualia are characteristics or qualities that determine the nature of a mental experience. When you have a sensation, when you have a perception, the quality or the characteristics of this experience, of sensing something, of perceiving something, these characteristics and qualities are known as qualia. And qualia make such mental experiences distinguishable from other experiences which are not mental or which are different. So the qualia of sensation or the qualia of perception render sensation and perception distinguishable from exercise, physical exercise, for example, or from sadness, which is another form of mental experience. The experiencer differentiates between sensations. Now, sensations could be sensor, could be sensory inputs, for example, feeling cold or feeling hot. They also have qualia because they are converted and translated into mental equivalents or mental experience. Now they are, we distinguish between primary qualities and, and secondary qualities and so on and so forth. Um, there's, there are huge debates in the materialist tradition, dualist tradition. I don't want to go into all this. This is not a lesson in philosophy. Remember, we are focused on the narcissist's inner experience or actually on the question does the narcissist have an inner experience? And if the narcissist does not have an inner experience, as I keep as I keep stating in all my videos, if the narcissist is an absence, a void, a black hole, an empty schizoid core, what is it that's happening inside the narcissist? And how is it communicated to the narcissist environment, human environment, including his victims? What is the infection vector? shall we say, what's the virus that carries the narcissistic load from one individual, the narcissist, to another who is being narcissized somehow, someone who develops complex trauma, which again, I remind you, is indistinguishable from cluster B personality disorders. The qualia are the phenomenal conscious states of feelings specific to each emotion. The ineffable phenomenal states of, I don't know, anger, happiness, fear, sadness. These are qualia of effect. We also have qualia of sensor, cold, hot, light, dark. They also have qualia. Anything that's translated to an internal, mental, psychological experience has qualia. Now, let's proceed from qualia to zombies. In the philosophy of mind, the zombie argument is any of several arguments that focus on the question of how one might distinguish conscious beings, humans, we, from hypothetical non-conscious beings called zombies. The zombies act as human beings do. They are capable of performing all the functions of conscious beings like human beings. They are indistinguishable phenomenologically, externally. If you just observe zombies, you are not able to tell that they are not human beings. Forget the zombies in the movies. The philosophical zombie, the pea zombie, is fully functional and doesn't stutter and doesn't stumble and doesn't just functions like you, like you and me. So how can we tell the difference? And this is the core uh, of the zombie argument and the huge number of debates around the zombie argument, because this leads to the question, can artificial intelligence acquire consciousness at any given, in any given future? And in psychology, it leads to the question, what is the empty schizoid core? If indeed narcissists and borderline, borderlines have nothing inside, 
they are founded or they are just a shell wrapped around an emptiness, could we say, therefore, that they are zombies? They function like human beings. They look like human beings. For, all this, for the sake of appearances, they are human beings. They talk the talk. They walk the walk. I mean, how could we tell if they are human beings or not? The emptiness is the distinguishing feature, the differential diagnosis, if you wish. This emptiness inside, if I am, I and, you know, hundreds of psychoanalysts and psycho and, and theoreticians, if we are all right about this and there's nothing in there, there's nobody in there, then, yeah, narcissists and borderlines are the real life zombies. Narcissists way more than borderlines because borderlines do have access to positive emotions. They do have a modicum of empathy, however diminished, but narcissists and even I would say psychopaths to some extent, they are zombies. By asserting that a zombie-like organism could behave as if it were conscious, but still lack an experience containing qualia, a mental experience, an inner experience. So a zombie is something that simulates, mimics, imitates, emulates human beings, but there it has no experience of itself, not definitely no experience of itself emotionally, no affect, no experience of affect. Now, narcissists, of course, do have sensor, sensor. they do have inputs through the senses, they, they see, they hear, and so on and so forth. But we are, when we discuss narcissism, we're limiting ourselves to the emotional aspect, the cognitive aspects, the distortions that render the narcissist empty, non-existent internally, a landscape which is essentially a wasteland. So. A zombie-like organism look, walks, and talks like a human being, but lacks an experience containing qualia. How are we going to distinguish consciousness as a subjective experience from consciousness as evidence from observable behavior in the physical world? In other words, we don't have access to anyone's mind. We don't have access to anyone's mind. Wittgenstein was wrong there. Everyone has a private language. Absolutely. The intersubjectivity -subject problem in philosophy is exactly this, that we cannot access anyone else's mind. We rely 100% on self-reporting by other people and on comparing external behaviors with our external behavior. So if someone cries, we would tend to say that they are sad because we are sad when we cry. It's the outcome of comparison. Empathy is not about other people. It's about oneself. Empathy is a huge database, base, a huge table comparing external observations or observations of external behaviors with one's own behaviors and making deductions based on these comparisons. Similarly, the problem of consciousness. When we talk to another person, how do we know that that other person is A, conscious, and B, a human being? <laughs> the answer is, we don't know. We cannot know, in principle, whether someone else is a human being. We have to rely 100% on observable phenomena and on that person's self-reporting. Yeah, I'm like you, I'm a human being. That's not very safe ground, you would agree. And this is where narcissists come in. They keep telling people, I'm human, I'm just like you. And people fall for it and become victims and then later become infected and become pseudo-narcissists or quasi-narcissists, at least for a while. So narcissists walk around misreporting their internal experience, mislabeling their psychodynamics, posing as human beings, mimicking, emulating, and imitating sentient, conscious humans, when actually 
They're not. They're not. And in this sense, yes, narcissists are the real life zombies. And this has to do with behaviorism, physicalism, and so on and so forth. My next lecture would be dedicated to behaviorism, its strong points and its, its pitfalls. Right now, let's stick with the zombies. The most popular topic in theory of mind research is what we call first order belief. The realization that it is possible to hold false beliefs about events in the world. Fair enough. But there's something called second order false belief. And this applies to narcissism. Second order false belief is the realization that it is possible to hold a false belief about someone else's beliefs. And that's where the narcissist, the psychopath, come in. They induce in you a second order false belief. You, they make you believe wrong things about their own beliefs. They mislead you. They deceive you. The psychopath does it intentionally. The narcissist does it unconsciously and automatically and reflexively, but the outcome is the same. Both of them broadcast false advertising. Deceptive signaling is the clinical term. So they, by signaling, they deceive you. And the major deception there is, I'm human, a human being. And these are my beliefs. And you tend, to, you tend to accept this as a victim or a would-be victim. You tend to accept this because they look human, they talk, they walk, they smile, they, they cry. They, I mean, they look totally human. And so why not? Why not assume that they are reporting the truth about themselves? So this is known as second order false belief. And it leads to Zimbos. <laughs> no, it's not a word I invented. Zimbos are hypothetical zombie-like beings. So Zimbos are a class of zombies. Zimbos are behaviorally indistinguishable from humans. They are responsive to their changing environments. They're capable of complex mental operations. So they are highly deceptive. Zimbos are highly deceptive, even much more than zombies. What's the difference? Zombies provide you with observable external phenomena. They induce you to compare yourself with them and then to say we are the same. So the whole operation is in your mind. You observe a zombie and you make deductions based on your own experience of yourself based on your own qualia, based on your own sensor, based on your own emotions and cognitions, you say, well, the zombie is just like me. Zimbos are one step further. Zimbos are truly responsive to their environment. They're not faking it. They're not mimicking. They're not simulating. They're truly responsive to their environment, and they are truly capable of complex mental activities, operations, and functions. They're not, they're not a forgery like a zombie. Zombies are uh, Zimbos are between zombies and humans, and yet they are one step removed from a human being. They are not human. But because they are such a great imitation, not imitation, because they are truly endowed with these capacities, most people would mistake a Zimbo for a human being. Indeed, in 1970, a Japanese roboticist, Masahiro Mori, suggested that advanced robots, which we, we would call today Zimbos, advanced robots who would be able to mimic humans perfectly, truly adapt positively to their changing environments, and capable of internal complex mental operations, he said that this kind of robots, Zimbos, would induce uh, discomfort in real human beings. And he said the only way 
to test whether someone is a Zimbo or a human being is, do you feel uncomfortable with that entity? Do you feel ill at ease? Do you feel that something is off? Um, an off note, uh, something is wrong, something is imperfect, something doesn't fit, or something is too perfect. And he called it the uncanny valley. And so the uncanny, uncanny is, a, is a phrase coined by, a uh, word coined by, who else? Sigmund Freud. The uncanny valley is a feeling of ex acute discomfort that you cannot account for, you cannot explain to yourself when you're in the presence of something that looks 100% human, acts 100% human, reports emotions and cognitions which are 100% human, is indistinguishable from a human, human being, and yet you feel extremely threatened or ill at ease. Why is that? Because it's not a human, it's a Zimbo. Anyone who is meta-narcissist or a psychopath would tell you that they induce an uncanny valley response. Exactly like a future android, which is indistinguishable from a human being, psychopaths and narcissists are robots, forms of artificial intelligence, zimbos, which are indistinguishable from human beings. And the only way to tell that something is wrong with these walking, talking entities is your uncanny valley alarm. So why, why do people fall for narcissists and psychopaths? Because their uncanny valley alarm is disabled or disrupted or destroyed or obstructed or masked. Some people um, have been subjected to early childhood abuse and trauma, grew up in dysfunctional families with the dead with a dead mother, a mother who is absent, depressive, selfish, instrumentalizing, parentifying, have been exposed to other forms of peer-induced rejection and trauma, etc., etc. Trauma and abuse in early childhood and adolescence would tend to turn off your alarm, your uncanny valley reaction. And then you would come across a narcissist and a psychopath and your alarm won't work. And you would fall for these entities, you would wrongly surmise that they are actually full fledged human beings. They are not. Narcissists and psychopaths are not human. They are not demons. They are not, I mean, let's, uh, let's skip the BS. But I would agree, and I've been saying it for 30 years, that they are not fully human. They are not full fledged humans. They are half, they are half baked, <laughs> they are incompleted. Uh, the, the process has been uh, hasn't been completed. Okay, the concept of Zimbo was first introduced by U.S. philosopher Daniel uh, Dennett. It was a response to the zombie argument. Dennett's position is fascinating because Dennett said that all human beings are Zimbos. We have no way to ascertain that other people are not Zimbos, therefore it would be rigorous and safe to assume philosophically that all human beings are Zimbos. I beg to differ, I completely disagree, but that's a topic for another video. I do think, however, that narcissists and psychopaths are Zimbos. Dennett, argue, Dennett argued that when philosophers claim that zombies are conceivable, they invariably underestimate the task of conception or imagination and end up imagining something that violates their own definition. And so he coined the term Zimbos, psychological P zombies that have second order beliefs. And he argued that the idea of P zombies, psychological zombies, is incoherent unless we introduce Zimbos. Zimbos think that they are conscious, he said. Zimbos believe that they have qualia Zimbos report suffering pain. It's just that Zimbos are wrong, according to their lamentable tradition, in ways that neither they nor we could ever discover. That's not Sam Vaknin, that is Dennett. I, was, I just quoted him. Let's proceed. 
and discuss affect. I keep claiming in my videos that narcissists have no access to their positive emotions and psychopaths have no access to any emotion. Even psychopaths' negative affectivity, negative emotions, are very goal-oriented. They are weaponized and instrumentalized. The narcissist's negative uh, uh, affectivity, negative emotions, envy, rage, anger, etc., uh, sadness even, the narcissist's negative emotions are real, and he experiences them the way other people experience their negative emotions. The way non-narcissists experience sadness, envy, and anger. But the narcissist has no access to any positive emotion. So here's the answer to your question. Can a narcissist love? No, he cannot. Psychopaths weaponize and instrumentalize emotions. They have no access to real emotions, but they know to imitate and emulate emotions perfectly. And all this leads to the question of affect. Let us define affect. Affect is any experience of feeling or emotion, re ranging from suffering to elation. We can have simple affect, we can have complex affects, which involve multiple sensations or feelings or sensations of multiple emotions. We can have normal affect, we can have pathological emotional reactions, that would constitute pathological effect. We can even have flat effect, reduced effect display. We can have positive effect. We can have negative effect. Mood and cognition are also effects. That is a common mistake online among self-styled experts. I repeat, moods and cognitions are effects. Emotions are effects. They are all forms of each other. Emotion is a form of cognition which is directional, for example. So they are all affects. Along with cognition and conation, affect is one of the three traditionally identified components of the mind. So mood and emotions are affects. Moods and emotions are affects. And we have cognition and conation. I will explain. Cognition. Cognition is any form of knowing and awareness, perceiving, conceiving, remembering, reasoning, judging, imagining, problem solving. These are all cognitions. I just said a minute ago that emotions are forms of cognition, actually, and that's the linkage between affect and cognition. Uh, cognition, affect, and conation. These, I said, are the three components of the mind. So what is conation? Conation is the proactive, not the habitual, but the chosen, the outcome of a decision or a choice, the proactive part of motivation, the part that connects knowledge, affect, drives, desires, and instincts, all these to behaviors, the translation, the bridge, between these elements of the mind and behaviors. Along with effect and cognition, cognition is, again, one-third of the mind. Uh, it's also known as the cognitive component. We will discuss uh, these things in, in future videos. Uh, but right now, it's important to understand that effect, uh, cognition, and cognition are the precursors, the precondition to attitude, motivation, and behavior. The narcissist is deficient in all three. He is unable to uh, access positive emotions, so he is crippled emotionally. His moods are binary, good, bad, but never never reach the level of lability of the borderline, for example. So his, his moods, I would say, are flat. They're binary. They can change from feeling very bad to feeling very good, but they're pretty flat. And 
so there's a, a problem with these moods as well they're not good signalers they don't send good signals internally his cognition is distorted narcissists suffer myriad cognitive distortions the most notorious of which is grandiosity and his conation consequently is very problematic because he would be un he is unable to connect emotions with cognitions with desires with instincts with knowledge with effect because each and every areas each and every one of these areas is severely dysfunctional and deficient remember the definition of narcissistic personality disorder an all pervasive pattern it narcissism pathological narcissism is a cancer that has metastasized to every nook and cranny of the mind consequently the narcissist conation is is a problem the conative component is a problem and because of this the narcissists have an issue with attitude and um, attitude object and this is the last topic of today's video so we have a model of attitudes known as the tripartite model of attitudes it's a theory of attitude structure it proposes that attitude is based on or even consists of there's a debate affective cognitive and behavioral components the affective component refers to feelings emotions which are associated with the attitude object we'll discuss the attitude object in a minute the cognitive component has to do with beliefs about attitudes associated with the attitude objects and the behavioral component is reflects experience past behaviors and future intentions associated with the attitude object in all three the narcissist is impaired dramatically impaired his emotions are crippled is an invalid emotional invalid as i just said is disabled is unable to process or to access positive emotions which are like the main driver and motivator in interpersonal relationships and in everyone's life of the mind so he is in this sense he is half human if you wish his cognitive component is distorted and biased his beliefs about attributes associated with others are completely off base he suffers from an external locus of control alloplastic defenses paranoid ideation persecutory delusion i mean you name it he's totally wrong about other people he, he misreads social cues and sexual cues as badly as someone with autism spectrum disorder so this this thing this element of uh, in in the model of attitudes is also impaired and the behavioral component is constricted by the narcissist's overriding need to avoid narcissistic injury or narcissistic modification to his fragile self-state. Remember, the narcissist is fragile and vulnerable. All narcissism, as I've been saying for decades, all narcissism is compensatory. And today, this is becoming the dominant view. So there's a fragile broken vulnerable thing there whatever it may be the narcissist is protective and defensive delusionally creating a bubble which minimizes the threats and reduces and ameliorates and mitigates anxiety consequently the narcissist cannot relate attitudinally cannot develop the appropriate attitudes to an attitude object the attitude object is any target of judgment that has an attitude associated with it attitude objects may be people social groups policy positions abstract concepts even physical objects we behold another person and we say let's gather information we do we react emotionally as well so we have a cognitive component of surveillance surveillance and, and research we have an emotional component which is often submerged in big part in the unconscious and then we developed an attitude to that person 
could be an attitude. Some of these attitudes are emotions, so we can fall in love. Some of these attitudes are, oh, great. It could be a, a partner, in a business partner. Let's do business together. Whatever the case may be, the narcissist is incapable of judging attitude objects correctly. Consequently, his attitudes would always be wrong because the basis of the attitude, the attitude base, it's a clinical term, is malfunctioning, impaired, broken, disrupted, distorted, biased, etc. The base of an attitude is the type of information from which an, an attitude is derived. So we distinguish between affective basis, which refers to emotions, feelings, and moods associated with the attitude object, a cognitive basis, beliefs, about evaluative attributes associated with the attitude object. And behavioral basis refers to responses, past behaviors, future intentions, etc., etc. These are components of an attitude. Let us summarize. What do we have here? We have here an entity that to all appearances looks human. In other words, we have a symbol. And yet, is unable to emote properly is cognitively severely impaired and, and is attitudinally erroneous, gets, gets it wrong all the time, develops the wrong attitudes. And so these glitches in the system, these bugs, evident via observable behavior. So when we look at the narcissist, we look at the psychopath, we say, oh, oh my God, something is wrong with, it, with these people. And on first encounter, we develop discomfort, unease, unless our uncanny valley alarm is disabled, and then we become victims. This is the picture. Narcissists are zimbos, masquerading as human beings, and they succeed to mislead people whose uncanny valley alarm has been disabled in childhood and adolescence. And these people become their victims. They get infected. And they develop narcissistic and psychopathic and borderline behavior, behaviors and dysregulated emotions, also known as complex PTSD, which is then indistinguishable for a while from cluster B personality disorders. Luckily, CPTSD is transient. Com uh, cluster B personality disorders are lifelong, and that's the difference. There's a diagnostic difference between the two. That's why borderline personality disorder is very real. It's a lifespan disorder. We're at least well into someone's 40s. And it's a stable thing clinically. It is a clinical entity. Therefore, borderline personality disorder can never be and should never be confused or conflated with complex trauma, which is a transient condition, reactive to highly specific circumstances and triggers. But putting all this aside, Zimbos create Zimbos the same way zombies create zombies in horror movies. Zimbos are contagious. If you fell into the orbit and ambit of one of these creatures, beware. The sooner you extricate yourself, the better your chances are to rediscover yourself in the future. The more you're exposed, the more your defenses are disabled, you decompensate, you become wide open to the contagious virus or contagion vac vector. And ultimately, if you spend decades with these people, the damage is so serious that in some cases, it can never be undone.